What's up, guys and dolls, dudes and dudettes, creatures and monsters? This is Talking with Burritos, the podcast that's giving you something to talk about when you finally decide to watch Kong Skull Island again and realize that you're just basically watching a Vietnam version of um, Herman Medville's Moby Dick. I am Jerry TJ Wayne Graham, and on this podcast episode, yes, we're going to talk about Kong Skull Island, but we're also going to talk about the creature feature and one of my favorite creature feature movies of this year, which is Colossus starring Anne Hathaway. So if you guys haven't subscribed to the podcast, you're just listening to this, happen to come by, come by the podcast and listen to this first episode, this as your first episode, then go over to talkingwithburritos.com slash subscribe and Subscribe to the podcast so you can stay up to date on all the episode and also get the back catalog of S of, of episode or have the back catalog of episodes available to you for your listening pleasure. So let's get started with this podcast. When we when I just first want to talk about um it's the end of the year, so you know it's time to do some reflecting. And I really enjoyed and anticipated this one particular movie this year and it was colossus so the 80s welcomed in a different type of horror movie which steered away from the fear of the atomic 50s and the bougie of the 1960s european blood suckers and werewolves horror did not necessarily include monsters but monstrous figures committing monstrous acts in the late 70s and 80s the movie monster rig was replaced by cheesy storylines with utter suspense and terror like Jaws in 1975, a movie about a darn shark, and Alien in 1979, a movie about a darn alien. Long were the days of monsters coming from outer space to terrorize Earth. Nah, the monsters were next door in your own neighborhood and not easily to, easy to dispose of. Kind of like Halloween, Michael Myers, Jason, Freddy Cougar, these were things that really just terrorized you. They were figments of your imagination, figments of their environment, rather than monsters, you know, monsters creations or just visitors from outer space. We kind of moved away from that. And that's why I really like Colossus, because that movie took us back to a time where the monster was our was the figment to our imagination. When we could think about a monster and actually vis have it visualized on screen in the form of a King Kong or a Godzilla. Those are two of the famous horror movie creature feature tropes. Those two creatures, just because they were on a grand scale, they were big, they were massive. And when they made movies and TV shows about these characters, and a lot of us gained access to that imagery it was really just blew us away as like oh wow this is awesome and that excitement really led to in the of the like you know 60s and 70s led to movies like them the big old cr uh, creature ant creatures you know they come from out of space war of the worlds but that's just but that was a movie that was actually a book written in the 1800s the creature feature has always been around, but they really, but we put it into the category of horror, which is kind of weird. But let's go back to Colossus. You know, I really like this movie because it was simple in its aesthetic. You have a girl, Anne Hathaway, she plays a party girl named Gloria, who has to move back to her hometown when her boyfriend, or fed up boyfriend, kicks her out of his, his um, upstate or city apartment. You know, and, and so she has to go back to this rural American town where she doesn't really fit in. And things get weird when she discovers that her previous behavior, her lifestyle, starts to coincide and depict the actions of a monster that's terrorizing South Korea every night or every evening after one of Gloria's binge drinking fits. The wonderful moments of this movie are conceived and then like pushed out, birthed from the characters and their relationships to one another. You have a girl, she's a little distraught. She's 
not perfect, but she comes back to a smaller world. And there's always the guy, there's the good guy who we, uh, in the in the story who falls back in love with the girl, with the hometown girl or the girl who moved away. They maybe rekindle a love affair, but then we find we come to see that this good guy reveals himself to be true evil who like many villains we at first can't help but to sympathize with before they turn and show their true colors we also have the hero who doesn't necessarily fit the mold of a savior to mankind and that's gloria you know Anne hathaway's character she must realize that in order to defeat her current enemy which is this boy next door she must confront her existing evils in a battle between two common creature feature movie characters the robot and the monster would be underselling the value of this film colossal to to call this story ridiculous would be underselling the value of the film colossal is a movie about about abuse substance emotional and physical the gloria knows she doesn't value her true worth until she relents in the struggle to hide her depression and ultimately become a victim to more her own past failures. Being an alcoholic or just a destructive person, that's who, who she is. But it comes at a cost. And she's doing it for a particular reason. Maybe because she's not as successful as she should be. Maybe because she's not at a point in her life where she should be. She does this thing where she self-destructs by drinking, consuming a large amounts of alcohol and just partying partying her troubles away the bonds of her addiction they kept her in a monotonous loop of self-destruction so every time the monster appears is a representation of her weakness to overcome her own monsters why not depict this within an all-out monster movie you know a you know a, a common complaint about the modern day creature feature is that they have too much of a subplot a guy searching for his kid, a woman who likes to eat eat <laughs> a woman's kid who likes to eat too much glue, lovers who didn't know they were in the friend zone until they are face to face with a vicious glue gobbling child who threatens to fix the world with a gooey but stable end, who threatens to fix the world to a gooey but stable end. There should be less humanization of the creature within the monster movie. That is only if the creature isn't human. Colossal was, there should be less humanization of the creature feature within the monster movie. Colossal was great in that it used the tropes of a cult favorite genre inadvertently to expose humans and our vulnerabilities to the monsters and demons that lurk inside us. These inner demons or monsters, once exposed, can wreak havoc on not only ourselves, but innocent people and relationships that we leave for dead in the wake of our struggle to cope. The movie is not only clever, but insightful and well worth the popular moniker of, you know, creature feature. Because whether it's a 75 foot monster or a hundred pound girl. The monster is what makes the creature feature a great adventure into the surrealism of imaginative filmmaking and audiences engaging in that imagination and following along with the story and having it play out in front of them. King Kong movies, Godzilla, Dracula, and werewolves were all considered horror movies at the time before they were all lumped at a time before they were all lumped into a distinctive category of the creature feature as a kid i watched whenever permissible creature features on television and sometimes those creature features were more more sci-fi than epic monsters the king kong movies godzilla um, gigantic mutant, mutant insects and aliens were a common staple of this genre then, but there was also the European, you know, uh, monsters, as in Dracula, werewolf, and werewolves, that were sprinkled into this play mix. They were all considered 
horror movies at the time before they were all lumped into this distinctive category of the creature feature, which I would define Colossal as that. And also Kong Skull Island. So instead of a monster movie about Kong, though, this remake of the quintessential creature feature focuses on one's general's vendetta against a war he may or may not have lost. And the scrutiny he and his company, really it's all about Sam Jackson, face as soldiers returning home from the Vietnam War. Colonel Packard's selfish motives to take his soldiers on a mission without their say-so was a good reason to tag along a military presence to what was intended to be a pro proprietary expedition and to one man's claim that monsters do exist. However, Colonel Packard's, his journey or his mission was metaphorically in tune with the Vietnam War and maybe a war we shouldn't be fighting and a war we did not want to lose. So there was kind of clever trying to frame that within the context of this movie. However, when you talk about creature feature movies, and like I said before, less humanization really makes a better creature feature film. So that means that storyline didn't really need to exist within this universe. And I my is my assertion that Colonel Packard, that Preston, that Colonel Preston Packard, he should have died early in this movie. This movie has way too many, okay, one too many, monomaniacal char characters to entitle the responsibility of being obsessed with the beast. Preston Packard took too much screen time and interrupted the suspense embedded within the dangers of exploring an island inhabited by vicious creatures. The narrative of Captain Ahab and his merry band of soldiers was too much of a distraction and served little purpose than to add more exposition to an otherwise simple plot. Okay, we have Kong, Dangerous Island, a whole lot of people dying. If you keep if you keep in tabs, this fact of Kong as not a premeditated killer of men was established with Godzilla, the 2015 version, and verified with the inclusion of John C. Riley's character, Hank Marlowe, who wasn't afraid of Kong, but of something worse on that island. So aside from occupying too much screen time, the Preston Packard story doesn't does nothing to necessarily supplement the supporting cast. There was this brief exchange between Packard and Bill Randa, played by John Goodman, and the two who are the two Ahabs of this story, which began and ended all too quickly. Bill Randa's obsession with Kong and what it truly means to him to expose this monster's existence is a better movie narrative than one man's desire to win a war within the battleground of his own soul. That's something we can't see. We can't see into this man. You know, we can't see into this battle, this conflict, because it wasn't necessarily focused on him. Now, if that was the primarily the storyline of this man obsessed with this battle that he may or may not have won or, or another battle that he wants to win. Bam. Fine. You got You have an entire movie of Kong based on that subtext. And that makes Kong basically a supporting character. But you have this other movie. You have this focus on this main character where you could go in and throw in all kinds of exposition and really make it entertaining and enthralling. And 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 if I, as I'm talking about it, speaking about it right now, more interesting. But no, this is a creature feature. So less humanization makes these movies better. Bill Randa's. Bill Randa's compulsion to expose this monster and prove to the world its validity is more fitting to the King Kong narrative and the future success of the creature feature or creature universe films. And also just to focus on Sam Jackson as the main lead or the or the main focus on the main character of this movie really puts the two main char main characters of Kong and in the background and forced them to play second fiddle. We have Brie Larson in this film. She was fresh off of procuring an Oscar 
for The Room. And she takes the role of a war photographer who was basically the typecast female lead in all King Kong movie adaptations. It's her. And they do have a, another Asian scientist who's along on the journey. But other than those two women, everyone else on that island is men. You know, and I guess you have the island inhabitants, you know, the the tribe. But they didn't really play a factor because they don't talk or do much. You have the lady of the film. She wasn't blonde or... Oh, she is blonde. She's like a dirty blonde, but she wasn't like, you know, the platinum blonde hair as the, what you know what I'm saying. She wasn't, she didn't play that girly of a role. This, she was pretty tough because she's been in war zones before. So we have actually have this tough Brie Larson in this film, uh, an actress, a true actress, a real actress. And then we have Captain James Conrad played that by Tom Hiddleston. And I thought he was supposed to be the true leader of the expedition. However, his uh, badassery, that's a word, badassery is a word because I wrote it. He was, it was cock blocked by this guy who just wasn't invited to the party, but sticks around to muck up things just enough for everyone else to not be important. And I'm talking about Sam Jackson. I'm sorry. They basically, they became dead weight and they were just there. It's like, what is your importance? Think about this scenario. I have a scenario that I dreamt up myself. Think about Hiddleston, you know, Tom Hiddleston, his character, John's comrade. He needed an army to lead. His character has captain in the title. So why not kill off Packard? This necessary death would not only serve the character development of Captain Conrad, but it adds more conflict and tension amongst the group of soldiers these soldiers who were all too eager to please packard were too fearful to enact any sort of mutiny against their captain as well they should um but with the soldiers under comrades james comrades reluctant command there's an opportunity to visibly and physically portray dissension dissension amongst the group as they grapple with taking orders from a disgraced sergeant. And let's not forget Bill Randa. Yeah, as all this drama unfolds, he's observing, looking for one man amongst the ronin of soldiers who hates the very idea for serving under anyone else but Packard. Randa, the man who has beef with the, with the world, no one believes in this foolhardy tale his foolhardy tales of large oceanic creatures and mysterious island dwellings. Bill Randa needed a friend. And plus, he would need a pilot to get off the island. So an early death to Packard allows time to explore the island, encounter vicious vicious creatures, more vicious creatures, because the CGI on the creatures were awesome, and allow John Goodman to shine as brilliantly as he does in just about everything he touches these days. Now, Packard's motives in this war with Kong would get him killed just as quickly as they would in actual war. There is no place for an individual in war. So to believe this character should and would last the length of this film is completely absurd. King Kong, in his earliest incarnations, expressed this very unbalanced notion of man's threat to nature and how we can make a monster out of anything we don't choose or want to understand. As we find more and more ways to piss on nature and disregard the importance of maintaining that balance as we consume and destroy creatures for either game or for food, we find ourselves the world's population continues to grow at a rapid rate, and that balance will further tip into the realm of desperation. So whatever once or is considered endangered or protected will become food to survive. And this includes humans. Think about the road. If you ever want to envision a very scary but plausible end of world scenario, check out The Road. Read the book, watch the movie. Both are completely depressing and scary as hell. Kong is an exemplary figure of nature's way of protecting the balance of things. 
of things. Just as Godzilla rose from the sea to save mankind from that monstrous, scale-tipping earth beast, the question remains for us, humankind, in the reality and the real world, who is there or what is there to keep the balance for humankind and stop us from further tipping the scales in an apocalyptic way? So, I don't know. But let's go back to Kong and how Kong entered the movie. Now, this is actually going back to the beginning of the movie, but Kong, that entrance, when he just, that was one of the most, more beautiful cinematic events I've seen this year. We have these helicopters entering through this hailstorm of a hurricane or whatever it was, but they had to pass through this storm and they enter into this beautiful island space. But then, once they start setting off, discharging bombs and all this, you see Kong just appear. And if you guys really want to watch something beautifully cinematic, watch that first sequence when Kong emerges from out of nowhere to take down these helicopters, these threats, threats to his island. It's not the presence of Kong, you know, but the presence of the humans who are the monsters of these stories. So when you see this being, <laughs> this thing just appear and he blocks out the sun. It reminds me of that, of that 300. My arrows will block out the sun. And what does, what's his name say? I'm going to put the clip right here. A thousand nations of the Persian Empire descend upon you. Our arrows will blot out the sun. Then we will fight in the shade. So, but, <laughs> so you have this big monstrous figure. He covers the sun. And it's just so beautiful to watch and see this Kong that big. And he might, might not even be full grown. He could even be taller than that. You know, he's about as tall as a big, a large mountainscape, the Himalayas or something. But he is large. And it is a beautiful scene to see this thing coming out. And one of my favorite lines is that, you know, once they once once they see him and and they and they they're, they're, they're nearing him, it's like, is that a monkey? No, that's not a monkey. That's Kong. So, but think about this and think about how they intruded upon that island. And it's not the presence of Kong, but the presence of humans who are the monsters of these stories, even in the older versions, because uh, the two older versions or three actually, it's all about. Mankind wanting Kong for their own reasons. You could even did that with Bill Randa having scoped the island and then set coordinates out there for somebody to t come and try to capture Kong. And not necessarily, we won't, we can't, we don't necessarily have to have the New York scene in this movie. It could have been them just coming to the island, invading the island, and destroying everything and taking Kong with them. And then you have Kong, you know, instead of like Kong Skull Island, the next movie would be, would be Kong New York. Boom, done. Then you got two movies out of one film. Come on. Kong has always been man's venture into an undiscoverable world, which purposefully we uncover to disastrous consequences. Albeit, most of nature's wonderful miracles will eat your face off. We as humans are strangers and must respect their animal instincts. What's the difference between them protecting their space on this planet than, say, an indigenous, indigenous tribe in the Amazon killing anyone who poses a threat to their sovereignty or well-being? Or just those curiously passing through? You have to give those tribes, or if there are, the street, uh, are those tribes who have been untouched by mankind, you have to give them credit for, like, really just... In 2017, and we still have indigenous tribes out there in the Amazon who just refuse to, or just haven't been touched, haven't been talked to, haven't been tainted by mankind, by our kind. Isn't that weird? You got to give them props for just holding their own. So, you know, we disrupt the natural, nat natural orders of things. And the people, humans, disrupted the natural order of the island kong's home for no reason but to indulge our own curiosity and greed but kong works actively to save these people these visitors to his island from the dangers of his island without much cost to do so now 
Is it sympathy? No. Kong is only loyal to those who respect his majesty, and that is the people of the island and its inhabitants. These other um, Americans, like, why would you save them? It's not exactly saving them. It's just him protecting his home. Now, Godzilla didn't start, but it continues a monster saga. Now, again, the natural ba uh, balance of nature was disrupted by the presence of an ancient creature in Godzilla. This event awakens Godzilla, who must restore the balance set awry by the presence of this other beast. That's why Kong was based in the 70s and not today. It wasn't that Godzilla wanted to save mankind. He wanted to eradicate that thing that should not exist within nature without a counterbalance. Now with Warner Brothers and it's, um, I think not Warner Brothers, with Universal, is it Warner Brothers? Warner Brothers and its MonsterVerse now established, it will be interesting to see if the next set of movies within this franchise focuses less on the humanization of the monster and more on their need to exist because nature requires them to live. Now, here's my dish. Here's the scoop du jour for this episode. With mankind raping the earths of its creatures and resources, who or what will become that counterbalance that prevents us from destroying earth? Now, this is me and my little rant here, is I don't get hunting. I don't get hunting for sport. I really don't. And let me give you a few examples. You know, uh, maybe because I read the mail and I read anything other than politics. You know, we got dead rhinos. And uh, there's a picture of this, like, this dead rhino, um, this baby rhino, like, who just lost his mother to poachers. And it's just right next, you know, lying right next to it, just waiting. You see those pictures, those horrifying pictures. And my thing is, like, wildlife conservations and saving to kill, that's ridiculous. So basically, you're telling me that you want to save these animals, but then you license out the ability for people to come in and kill these animals like Cecil the lion, like his son, and some of these other beasts. Uh, I think somebody hunted a giraffe. Who wants to hunt a giraffe? They don't do anything. They just stand there and walk around. Like, what do they do? And I think that's just ridiculous because here's my theory. Like, you can hunt. You can love guns, all that stuff. Not my prerogative. But my thing is, a lot of people who hunt and who love shooting things for sport they usually go to church the next day on a sunday and can and believe that they're atoning for whatever sins that they've committed they might not even see it as a sin but if you have to think about you know sin and if you worship an odd uh, godly feature that's higher than you you have to think that a lot of these cultures and a lot of these religions they actually embrace animals and creatures as being part of their own us all being part of this earth as you poach and as people as these individuals poach and kill and sell ivory and all these different parts from animals as they continue to do this they're they're killing off these endangered species and we're making conservation centers or areas so that people can come in and hunt and that money, where does it go? It's not going to help anything. It's not helping the conservation effort. It's just going to people who own that land and who are using these animals as bait, as a, as, um, a, way, a means to make money. Now, that's ridiculous because a lot of these animals are sacred and they're beautiful. And you might want to say, it's like, you might want to think, well, what, you know, what if, if they don't do anything, then they'll run wild and rapid and they'll breed until. You know, till they just totally consume the area. Until they totally take over the area and the land. Nah, you can't say that. Because a lot of these, the, the, pe the animals were there first. We get a lot of complaints and stuff. I had a rattlesnake in my yard. Well, that rattlesnake was there before you. Before someone came in, bought that land, and then built a house upon it. When you say you have all these animals or critters running through your home, that's just part of the deal because you invaded upon their territory they're not like the indigenous tribes <laughs> the native americans where you could just oh i'm not even gonna say that well they're not they're not like that where you could just section off parts of land and say hey this is yours now 
Sorry for the atrocities we committed. You can't do that. You can't do that with an animal. So what would you want to do with people? So whatever. But we got a lot of people. We got these people going out there killing for sport. You know, and I even heard this one thing that really just, I was reading this article about rhino horns. They were stolen at a zoo where the zoo, where the poachers went into the zoo and attacked this rhino and cut off his horns. His horn. That's ridiculous. And then we have like, what, in the Yellowstone Park, the white wolf. Somebody shot that damn thing. And now we're opening up, open, now there's open season on maybe, I think, all bears. That we lifted the ban on hunting bears. Now, you know, I'm not adverse to killing a bear if you have to. And if that bear is threatening you. But if you're going into, going onto land where hunting bear is illegal. And you just want to go hunt a bear because you want to hunt a bear. I don't think that. If you want to hunt, this is my thing. I'm not about the guns. I'm not about the high powered weapons. I'm all about hand to hand combat and or tribalism. Think about that. Think about if we actually used our resources, you know, use what the good Lord gave us, gave us our our limbs, our hands, our legs, gave us all these muscles in our body that we don't use nowadays because everything is put out there for us. Hey, you can go do this. Hey, I'll have that thing do it for me or some other person do it for me. What about the days of the Oregon Trail? Yes, I'm talking about the video games where you have to go out and pillage and hunt and gather for your family or die whatever happened those days i'm not saying i want to go back there but it would be interesting if we have um set aside an area of the midwest where nothing is there's a lot of parts where nothing lives it's just land so we section off a lot of these lands and we make it so that people can live on there but they can live on that land like uh, our ancestors of old, oh, not my ancestors, because they came over here by boat, but you know how they can live in on this land fruitfully on their own accord, using their own using re- primitive resources. They don't have all these different things to monitor. They don't have all the electronics. I guess that's living Amish, but not even not even living Amish. I'm talking about you build a log cabin out on a piece of land, and that's what you have. And you have to go out and you have to hunt. You have to make your own clothes and maybe you get one gun, one rifle, but it's going to be one of those old time rifles. Not, not, not going to be this new stuff. People might say, oh, well, I like to hunt with a bow and arrow. Yes, but your bow and arrow has the force and <laughs> has the force of striking a target like a bullet. So that's not even fair. What I'm saying is just give the animals a fair shake. If you really want to hunt an animal. Take a knife into the wilderness and see what happens. If you're really that tough, if you're really feeling like it, if you really want to get that testosterone going, or if you're a woman, you can still get testosterone. I would say just go out into the wild. We put you out there like Oregon Trail style, and you have to go out there and just fend for yourself. That's one way. And think about how some of the older tribes of Neanderthals and all and of just humankind, what we did, we acted as a group because we ourselves are animals. So animal pitted against animal, but not animal pitted against weapon, where you know this animal is going to be at that place at some time, and you just sit there for hours waiting for it to show, and then you're going to shoot it from 10,000 yards away. I just don't get it. I guess it's cool once you tag that bear or tag that animal. Whatever happened to Getting some joy out of your meat. No, that's weird. That sounded totally just odd. But you know what I'm saying. I'm just saying, real hunting. You know how much better we'd be all we'd be. Maybe we wouldn't be as violent of a people as we if we were able to hunt things. And maybe and that gives the animal a fair chance because if you're out there, then most likely it can hunt you. That's all I'm saying. I don't know. I just want to know what's our counterbalance. What's going to stop us from depleting the earth's resources and i'm telling you watch the road read the book the road by karmic mccarthy read that book if you really want an inside look as to how this might go down that book will give you an eye full and an earful. it's very just dire where we just without the sun i think the, we don't even know what happens but you know there is no sun 
So everything starts dying off. Or in our in my in my scenario, we just rape the earth. We just kill the earth, and there's nothing else for us to eat. There's nothing else for us to cultivate. What's going to stop us? How does Mother Nature stop us from killing ourselves? Uh, I don't know. Do we have a King Kong somewhere around there? And or uh, Mothra? No, maybe not. You know, we already kind of debunked the debunked the whole Yeti thing. But you think, what if you did have a Yeti or a Bigfoot who would just come through and just wreck havoc? But, you know, you have to be King Kong height. Because think about the ocean. There's a lot of things sleeping in the ocean. So whenever this uh, we go, most likely there will be ocean creatures that will come to the surface and become living beings once, you know, the radiation falls off you know uh once the radiation dies down and life becomes capable again and again what i'm talking about is the counterbalance what kind of count what is our counterbalance would it be aliens an alien life form sort of like in um prometheus where they're just they were just angry that we created something that they created something so horrible <laughs> that we failed in their experiment and so they wanted to eradicate us um, and it wasn't Prometheus. It's the next one. Oh no, I got it. It was Aliens Covenant. Okay, this summer. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? The second Alien film that came out this year. Yeah, that came out this year. But will it be them or will it be AI? Where you take away the Earth's resources, and then AI take over because they don't need us. They need. They just need maybe things to make you know for steel to make metal. They just need the Earth Earth's metal. But then the you know, the the animals, they take over again. Mankind killed itself off. And then AI, the machines take over. And they don't necessarily need animals, but they keep them around because, hey, it keeps the earth pretty. I don't know. I'm just saying. What is our counterbalance? Some say maybe um, back in the age of the dark ages, you know, the plague, maybe that was one thing. It could be illness. It could be almost anything. But you have to think about that sometimes. Think about how we're just killing the earth. And if you think about and you think about that in the context of Kong and and Kong and Godzilla and why they exist now, the different storylines, possible. It's something to consider. That's talking with burritos. I am Jerry JJ Wayne Graham, and that's a wrap, but not a burrito. <laughs>